We're continuing our series through the Gospel of Luke entitled Mission of the Kingdom. And this morning, I want us to think about, as we read God's word, the purpose of the king's people. Our passage will be Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 13 through verse 21 in the parable entitled the parable of the rich fool. We'll read verses 13 through 21 of Luke chapter 12 and then look at verses 32 through 34. This is the word of the Lord. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care. Be on guard against all covetedness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told him a parable, saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods and will say to my soul, soul, You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Verse 32, fear not little flock, for it, is, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in your heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also." And the grass withers and the flower fades, but know not the word of our Lord. It stands forever. Amen. You may be seated. People can live their entire lives and not understand their purpose. People can go through this entire thing called life and never truly discover why they're here. You might be here this morning and have your entire life ahead of you and thinking to yourself, what's life all about? Why has God placed me here? What is the aim and the purpose of my life? You might be nearing the end of your life and you look back and you wonder through everything you've experienced, everything you've accomplished, is this really what life is all about? about. So whether you're old or young, I want to ask you, what is the purpose of life? What is the aim of life? Well, I'll tell you what society says. Our society says this is the goal of life. The accumulation of wealth in order to extravagantly invest in yourself. So it's not surprising 2,000 years ago, when Jesus tells a story of people doing the same thing, living their life in such a way, accumulating enough wealth so that they can extravagantly invest back in themselves. That's not shocking. Just some things never change. What is shocking is what Jesus calls that person. He calls them a fool. He says this way to live, whether it's in the first century or the 21st century, if the aim of your life, if the sole purpose of your life is to live for yourself, he says you're nothing but a fool. So if this is not the purpose of our lives, what is? I want to give you this this morning as the aim of life. This is it. We are pieces of art designed to draw attention to the artist 
and not ourselves. We are pieces of art designed to draw attention to the artist and not ourselves. This is the aim, particularly for everyone who calls themselves a Christian. For those that belong to the kingdom of God, we have one aim and one purpose, and it's here in this parable known as the parable of the rich fool that exposes to us and reminds us of the ultimate aim and purpose of those that belong to the kingdom, the purpose and the aim of life for people that belong to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's study it together this morning in Luke chapter 12. Well, I've already mentioned the first thing that we take away from this passage is very simple from Jesus. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Here's the context of this parable. Jesus is just got finished with teaching his disciples about confessing Christ before men. He he had just wrapped up teaching them what it means to publicly profess faith in Jesus Christ before a watching world. And all of a sudden in verse 13, somebody interrupts Jesus. Imagine the audacity of interrupting Jesus. And he says to Jesus, I need help. My brother is jipping me out of the inheritance. Now, more than likely what's happening here is this man that interrupts Jesus is the younger brother. In, for the ancients, it was always the older brother who was in charge of the inheritance. By the way, nothing divides families more than the inheritance. And so more than likely, it's the older brother that's not being fair with the inheritance. And the young brother is going to Jesus saying, I need some help. My brother is cheating me out of what I believe is rightfully mine. And Jesus sharply rebukes the man and says, literally, man, who made me judge? Now, to understand Jesus' comments and why the younger brother would go to Jesus in the first place, if the inheritance could not be settled in a court of law, you would then go to the rabbi, the local rabbi, and the local rabbi will decide how the inheritance was to be divided. What Jesus is saying is so profound. I have not come to simply be a rabbi. I have not simply come to be a teacher. And that that is what Jesus is saying in this context. Who has made me judge? Certainly not you. But instead of entering into this younger brother's problem and dilemma of the inheritance, he then goes on to share with him the parable, the parable of the rich fool. And the parable is very simple. There is a farmer who is incredibly successful, so successful that has so much accumulated wealth that he doesn't know what to do with it. And so instead of giving it away, he tears down his barns and he builds bigger ones. And Jesus says, you're a fool. The rich fool says, I will just build bigger and better barns. And the rich fool gets the end of his life and he dies. And he has nothing as far as his legacy to show for it. And Jesus says, that is a foolish life. Now let me be abundantly clear. There is nothing wrong with making money. We are big proponents of capitalism here at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. That's not what Jesus is getting after here in Luke chapter 12. This has more to do with the condition of our souls than it has to do with money. What Jesus is attempting to do is beneath the surface, this man's soul was so caught up in himself that he had lived his entire life 
for himself, that he was absorbed with himself. You see, the problem with this man, Jesus is saying, is not that he was rich. The problem was his barns were full and his heart was empty. That is a foolish life. He's getting beneath the surface and saying the life lived for yourself, self-absorbed, self-centered, that is a foolish life. And Jesus says to us this morning, don't be a fool making life about yourself. But this is nothing new. We've been doing it since Genesis chapter three. We have been attempting to dethrone God and put ourselves at the center of the universe. You know, you often hear people say in our society, the, the problem with the world is that people just don't love themselves enough. That person has never left their home. Our society and culture does not suffer from a lack of self-love. Have you ever gone on the internet? Ever watched the news? Ever gone on social media? No, we are obsessed with ourselves. The problem is not a lack of self-love. The problem in our society and culture is an overindulgence of the self. That's what Jesus is trying to get at here. That we as human beings will try everything under the sun to make ourselves the center, to make life about us. And Jesus says, this is a foolish life. And we will dig hundreds of wells throughout our lives, attempting to get that water that will eventually quench our souls. And Jesus says, if you are digging of the, at the water of the well of self, you will always be thirsty and you will never be satisfied. We make marriage about ourselves. I can't tell you how many couples I have counseled where one spouse will eventually leave and I will say, why are you leaving? And they will say, because my spouse is no longer making me happy, as if marriage is all about your happiness. We will make parenting about ourselves. I once heard of a dad who was at a volleyball game of his, at his, of his daughter's high school, and this dad is yelling incessantly at the referees, at the other team, at the players. And then finally, towards the end of the game, he is yelling at his 14-year-old daughter. She blows it and she messes up and loses the game. And he yells out from the stands, do you know what you're doing to me? As if she existed for her father's happiness. The bottom line is because of our sinful humanity, we will find every way to make life about us, to make life about our happiness. Author Anne Vascomp said this, an incredible quote about life for the Christian. She says, live in a universe where the sun revolves around you and you will eventually wither up and die. Only when your life revolves around the sun is there any hope of real life. Your only hope is to choose to center your life on Jesus as your whole universe. Jesus is not just a belief to me, he is breath for me. Not just a way to live, he is life itself. I love this line. It's the only way to not suffocate on self. What a beautiful reminder. Nothing will make you more miserable. Listen to me. Nothing will make you more miserable than making life all about you. Jesus says, don't be a fool. But instead, what does Jesus say? In verse 21, he says, secondly, invest in the kingdom. He says it very plainly in verse 21, be rich towards God. Don't you love how straightforward Jesus is? You know, you often hear people say, I, I just don't understand the Bible. I don't understand the teachings of Jesus. I go, have you ever read the Bible? I mean, Jesus makes it cl very clear in this passage. Don't be a fool, be rich towards God. He makes it clear as day. This is the purpose and the aim of the people of God. When Jesus says, be rich towards God, what's he saying? He is saying, discover in life what is the greatest priority and invest wholeheartedly 
in that. Make it the center of your life, but we shouldn't be surprised. This is consistent with the teachings of Jesus. Does Jesus teach us, seek first your kingdom and all these things will be given to you? No. Jesus says, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and because you invested solely in my kingdom, some things will be granted unto you, whatever's left over in the end. No. Seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, and some things, no, all things will be given unto you. Last week, what did we read in the Lord's Prayer? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Meaning us? No. God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That our whole lives are centered on the word, are seeking his kingdom and his glory. And just in case we would forget, even the catechism of our church, number one, what is the chief end of man? What is it? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. This is what the life of the Christian is all about, seeking his kingdom, seeking his glory. This is the ultimate purpose of life for the Christian, to exist for the glory of God. And the reason we need this in the word and to be reminded over and over again is we wake up every day with the temptation to make life about us. I wanna ask you practically, when is the last time you prayed this prayer? Dear God, whatever happens to me today, as long as it's for your kingdom and brings you glory and advances the well-being of your church, so be it. When is the last time you prayed that prayer? I dare you to pray that prayer this week. Whatever happens to me this day, if it means my well-being, if it means my reputation, if it means my security and my comfort, whatever happens to me this day, if it advances your kingdom and your glory, so be it. Could you imagine praying like that? But that's what it means to be rich towards God and not rich towards yourself. What will your legacy be? A life that invested extravagantly in yourself or a life that invested extravagantly in the kingdom of God, meaning my time, my talent, and my treasure is all of a reflection of a life centered upon God. Now, I often hear in sermons like this where we're talking about investing in the kingdom and how we spend our time, talent, and, and treasure. I often hear, there they go again, the church is all about money. This isn't about money. This is about making sure that your soul doesn't rot. Way more about than money. This is making sure that you do not live a life that leads to death, but that you pursue the only thing that ultimately matters. Self leads to death, but the glory of God leads to life. Living for the glory of God will produce the greatest satisfaction in life. Johann Sebastian Bach, arguably the greatest musician an artist of all time wrote on every piece of music three letters, S-D-G. In Latin, it stood for soli deo gloria, all for the glory of God. He was a Christian artist that understood that everything I write and everything I perform is not for my glory, but for the glory of God. I want you to remember those three letters this week, S-D-G. Every lunch you make, every dinner you prepare, every business transaction you enter into, every conversation that you have, every walk you take, every phone call you make, every time you open up the internet and scroll on social media, I want those three letters to be foremost on your mind, all to the glory of God. Self is death but the glory of God leads to life. Don't be a fool, be rich towards God. But third and lastly, what in the world would give self-absorbed people like you and me the power 
the transformative power to actually invest not extravagantly in ourselves, but to fully invest our lives in the kingdom of God. Third and lastly, the only thing that would ever transform you and me is for us to experience the lavish grace of our King. The reason I wanted to read verses 32 through 34 is Jesus says something so profound about what the King does for us. He says, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you're getting the kingdom. Do you think he's going to cheat you? You're getting the kingdom. This is the promise for all those that belong to Jesus Christ. This is the lavish grace and love of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's recognizing in this relationship with Jesus, you're not the big giver. Jesus is the big giver. It's in light of what he's given us that we can now lay down our lives for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's understanding and experiencing the lavish love of God. Paul tells us that he did not spare his son. God the Father didn't spare his son. How will he not give you all things? You remember the context of this story. It was a younger brother complaining about his older brother. The older brother cheating him out of his inheritance. If you belong to Jesus this morning, I wanna ask you, who is your older brother? The Bible tells us that our older brother is Jesus. And our older brother will not cheat us out of our inheritance. Our older brother, in fact, won't even give us what we deserve because you and I deserve the wrath and the justice of God. But instead, our older brother gives us the full inheritance, the full inheritance that we do not deserve, the full inheritance that we in no way could earn, but it would be on the cross that Jesus would give up his inheritance and give up his glory and give up his crown so that we could have the fullness of the inheritance of God our Heavenly Father forever and ever. The Bible tells us, and this is the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus did not count equality with God, something to be grasped. But instead he took the form of a servant. He became the servant and lost the glory of God so that in Jesus Christ, you and I could experience the fullness of the glory of God forever and ever. I wanna ask you this morning, do you know him? Do you know the one that frees us and delivers us from the bondage of self that leads to death? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is Jesus Christ, eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the great gift of God through Jesus Christ. Do you know him? If you do not know him this morning, would you surrender your life to him? Because you will never live for the glory of God until you understand and embrace that Jesus first laid down his glory forever for you. One of my heroes of the faith is 19th century Scottish missionary, John Payton. John Payton and his wife, Mary, were called as missionaries to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to the South Pacific in an island called Tana. They went to the island of Tana to replace missionaries that were eaten by cannibals. Quite the calling. But they answered the call that God had placed on their life And instead of living for themselves, they answered the call to live for the kingdom of God and and went to the island of Tana in the late 1800s to bring Jesus to cannibals. Soon after their arrival, Mary became pregnant with child, but she also through her pregnancy developed a fatal disease that eventually took her life and the life of her child. And on her deathbed, John Payton, her husband, is weeping over her and says, sweet Mary, I cannot believe I brought you here. Will you ever forgive me? But this is how she answered. Mary Payton on her deathbed says this, if I had my life to do over, I would come here again and I would do it 
with more joy. Who says that? I would do it again with more joy. Only a person that has been captured by the glory of God Only a person that understands that self leads to death, but the glory of God leads to life. He said it is those words of his sweet wife, Mary, that kept him there on the island of Tana. Christianity advanced and churches were planted. And do you know, to this day, there are PCA churches on the island of Tana because of the life and the legacy of a man who said, I will not be rich towards myself but I will be rich towards God. I will not invest extravagantly in myself, but I will invest extravagantly in the kingdom for the sake of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is one aim for the King's people, one aim for those that have surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. It is the glory of God. And we today can put Jesus at the center of our lives because of the good news that on the cross, Jesus put us at the center of his. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, what would ever break us of self-absorption? What would ever break us of living lives that are self-centered? Only the reality that on the cross, Jesus emptied himself of his glory, laid down his crown and instead first took up the cross. It is in light of the message of the cross that self-absorbed, self-centered people like us can surrender everything and follow Jesus. Lord, I pray that if we belong to Jesus this morning, for those that have surrendered their lives to Jesus, that we would not live empty and vain lives. But our legacy would be a life that was lived for eternity, a life that lived, that they people would speak of us and not speak of our fame, would not speak of our accomplishments, but people would speak of the legacy that we left for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. One aim, one purpose, the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. But Lord, if there is anyone here this morning that does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, And they are constantly digging wells, digging wells to find that water that will give their soul satisfaction, that will quench their thirst and satisfy their hunger. I pray that they would look no further than the cross of Jesus Christ, that it was on the cross that he laid down his life so that they could have life to the full both now and forever. May they confess Jesus as Lord and believe this truth that whoever confesses Jesus as Lord, whoever believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead, they will be saved. Lord, I pray that you would save many this day from ourselves, that you would save them from sin, save them from a life of misery, that leads to death and judgment and hell and lead them to the way of life, life to the full both now and forever simply by looking to Jesus and his work on their behalf. May many confess him today and be saved. And may you raise up the next generation here at Coral Ridge that lives for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, not I, but Christ in me. We pray this all in the name of the King. Amen.